let's go to chapter two. What's it going to take? Ground rule number two, when you aim for the top, you make important progress by just aiming. What does that mean? Well, what's it going to take? I run into this, a, used to run into this a lot. People would say, well, we'd like to do this, but we don't have the budget for it. Mm -hmm. And then I'd say, well, what's it going to take? And they wouldn't be able to come up with an answer. <laughs> and like when I was at the New Jersey Nets as a consultant, I asked the ticket sales manager, I said, what's it going to take for the New Jersey Nets to have the best ticket sales staff in all of sports? And he said, everything that we don't have. And I said, well, for instance, what's it going to take? And I started to write down, he couldn't come up with a dollar amount. Um, I'll give you another one. Uh, Willis Reed was the general manager of the New Jersey Nets when I was there. Willis Reed, a Hall of Fame player from the New York Knicks, mm -hmm. one of the five nicest people I've ever met in my life. Just a terrific person. And I became president of the New Jersey Nets, but I didn't control player personnel. But it was difficult for me to watch when they kept on losing. So I walked down the hall one day to <clears throat> Willis's office and I said, Willis, what's it going to take for the Nets to compete for a championship next year? And he looked at me like he was trying to determine was I on drugs or something. <laughs> like, like, why would I ask such a silly question? And I said, seriously, what's it going to take? And he said, well, he said, you need two superstars and we only have one. And I said, really? I said, who's our superstars? And he said, well, Derek Coleman. I said, the same Derek Coleman that told the coach, you can have me for practice or you can have me for the game. Only one of the two who wouldn't practice. I said, that's not exactly a leading superstar. I said, well, and he said, and besides, we don't have enough money. I said, how much is, how much is it going to take to compete for a championship? And he said, probably, and he didn't have it at the, on his fingertips. He said, probably uh, two or $3 million. This is back around 1991. Huh. I said, really? I said, so, so if you had an extra two or $3 million, you could compete in a year from now for a championship. He says, yeah. Now he's thinking, that's an impossible. And I said, well, I'm president of the team. I'm the chief operating officer. I control the money. I think that's doable. I think we do the two or $3 million. Now what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, uh, but I, I asked that question a lot when I was out there because I wanted people to think, oh, how do, can you be great? And, Generally, Stan, the answer is, well, we don't have the money. Yeah. And generally, that's the wrong answer. It's they never say, well, we don't want to think more or that we don't want to really press things. It's always, well, we don't have the money. And that's generally not the reason uh, not to be great. Hmm. There's, uh, I've, I've got to go over, uh, boy, we don't have the time to go over all of them, but uh, and one of them I'm going to skip over, but it's a tremendous statement in and of itself. It's ground rule number six. If you mimic the market leaders, you just add to their dominance. That is right. that is so important. Right. I hope I hope the students really understand what what you've just said there. But I do have to ask this: uh, ground rule number seven. When a when a rare big opportunity comes along and you can't test it, fly without a net. Wow, that, <laughs> that takes guts, doesn't it? Um. Well, not if you've really thought it through. Like the idea with the outfield fence sign. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we said, okay, it's going to cost us $135,000. And that's if we don't sell anything. It's going to cost us $135,000, which is sort of crazy when other teams were just spending $10,000 to paint and paint the signs. Yeah. But then we started to come up with the packages, and we, were sell we thought we could sell the package for $195,000, the way we put it together. So then we thought, well, if we sold one of them, just one of them, that paid for the outfield wall. And then if we sold two of them out of the eight, 
that now we're making as much money as if you sold 70. And we felt that in even Dayton, which was a Rust Belt city at the time, we felt that in different categories that we could get, we thought we could get six or seven fairly, we thought that that would, uh, was doable. And we thought eight was the, was the limit. And we did get eight and we got about a million six in revenue. But the, the risk really wasn't much of a risk if you think it through, because you have to sell two out of the eight. Yeah. And if you really failed at that, at that price, you could cut the price and sell for less, which we never would have considered. But the risk really wasn't that great in our opinion. Um, lots of promotions, lots of things that you have been involved with. Uh, just for the sake of fun, what was your most fun promotion that, that you've done? There were so many fun things. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I mean, this is a fun business. Well, tell us <laughs> more. Tell us about the rubber chickens. I mean, I, when I read that, I said, I got to ask you about that. Well, I've used the rubber chicken several times. Um, and this was in New Jersey. We're trying to get the season ticket holders that we did have when I was a consultant. And then I went on to become president. They, a lot of them didn't renew until the day before the season started. They wanted to sort of see how the team was going to be. And then the day before the season started, they'd pay up. The problem with there'd be some that wouldn't pay up, they'd just uh, cancel. But that left, left choice seat locations that you could have moved people to, your current season to, or to better seat locations. So it was awkward for the team. And I was going to stop that as when I was a consultant there. So I was saying to the VP at the Nets, I said, I want to send out this uh, registered letter warning them that uh, we need to have an answer. And he says, yeah, he said, we've done things like that before, but they won't even open the letter. So I said, really? He says, yeah, they, they know that we're desperate. They know that they don't have to do anything until the day before the, the season starts. So I said, well, I bet I can get them to open this letter. And somebody had showed me this rubber chicken. It's about probably two feet tall. And I said, okay, we're gonna put a little uniform on it, a little paper uniform that says, don't foul out, F-O-W-L, read the letter. And attached to the chicken's leg was a personal letter from me to uh, the person. And we put it in a FedEx box, one of those three foot long FedEx triangular boxes. I said, I defy these hard line net season ticket holders that won't open something, not to open that box. <laughs> and then they pull out this rubber chicken and what's at the bottom of that letter? Stan, tell me which person wouldn't open up that letter. And I can't imagine. If I got something like that, I'd open it and read it in a heartbeat. <laughs> so the letter explained to them, we need to know, are you in or out? And I explained why. And I got phone calls, uh, guys laughing, say, I'm in. Um, and then I got a call from an Indian doctor. There were a lot of Indian doctors in northern New Jersey, India from in, Indian doctors from India. Mm -hmm. And the guy calls me up and he says, why did you send me this dead duck? <laughs> I, I don't think the chicken made his way over to India, the rubber chicken idea. Well, I used that idea in a couple other places and always got people to open up the letter. Well, that's, that's tremendous. Uh, absolutely tremendous. So what, I guess what I'm hearing in is, this, is that you can have a wild idea and if you pencil it out, then uh, maybe you can go with it. Well, in fact, I'm writing a book that says, get your idea of ideas approved. Job skill number one, how to get your boss to approve every idea you, you, you've got. And the part is that you really have to plan it out and you have to plan, you really have to do a lot of work on uh, the full planning. And then when, you, when you've done the planning on it, you realize this isn't such a crazy idea after all. Like the rubber chicken idea on the surface is really a crazy idea. Sending out a rubber chicken to a, a client who's spending thousands of dollars. But they all thought it was pretty funny. 
So, oh, fast forward. Uh, when we're Mandalay baseball, we got into a partnership with the New York Yankees with a minor league team. Mm -hmm. And I had to go to Yankee Stadium to meet the president of the New York Yankees. And I walk into his office, and this is when George Steinbrenner was alive. But I walk into his office, the president, and what's on his wall is one of the, my rubber chickens. He had better <laughs> see, he had better see order with the nets. <laughs> That's really good. One of the things we talk about in our class is, um, you know, not all jobs are with professional sports teams. Sometimes they're with uh, high school sports and even select sports. And right. all of the ideas that I hear uh, from you and from others, uh, my own experience in high school sports is that this could work there too, just on a smaller Absolutely. scale. Absolutely. Why, why don't they do these things? Do they just not know? Do they not have the talent to do that? I don't know if the pressure is there. Like I went to a couple of high school games, this uh, football game, and they didn't sell a program or they didn't give away a program. Oh. And so the next game I went to, I went online and downloaded the roster. So at least I know. And I thought, why isn't somebody in that high school selling a program that you could either give away You'd, you'd, you'd get a sponsor locally. I, I've got to believe that the pizza company next door would like to do something, or the one that's maybe not next door, but that's down the street. I, and a lot of those things stand, I, don't, I just don't understand. I went to a, a junior college basketball game. Enthusiastic crowd, and I saw no sponsorships. I saw nothing. And the game was really fun to watch. I'm thinking, I, the what my opinion is is the athletic directors don't look at that as being a part of their responsibility or purview. Mm -hmm. um, you know they've got other responsibilities, and you know selling sponsorships isn't one of them. And it could be it's not part of their expertise either. It well could be. It's just as a parent, um, I have. Uh, been tired of being asked for a donation when I feel like you could get more out of me if you gave me something of value. Yeah, see, I have, I don't believe in the donation part of that. I believe that of getting value. And there's a lot of different ways of being able to do it. But, and I'm not talking about charging the type of dollars that we charge, you know, in the pros. But definitely could make things better. One thing that we have to talk about uh, before we, we close is uh, COVID-19. How are sports teams, professional sports teams, going to be able to restart their sports from a marketing standpoint? Well, see, I don't think during the COVID-19 that they should have stopped marketing, even though it's very difficult. And I'll give you, a, uh, for instance, is uh, when, I was, when I was at the New Jersey Nets, this one year, there was a lockout at the end of the season. Mm -hmm. And it was major negotiations between the NBA and the Players Association. And they said there might not be a season. And we had just finished with an awful team. We'd won 19 games, I think, out of 82. You know, our team was awful. But even worse than that is our fans didn't like our star player, Derek Coleman. Yeah. They hated him. Well, he was hard to like. I remember right. him. Right. And they hated him. But the rules that we got passed down from the NBA is uh, you cannot mention any of your players in marketing or even verbally. You cannot mention the opposing players, of which we did a lot. We mentioned, oh, they're going to be playing. We're going to be playing Michael Jordan and Larry Bird. You know, we'd, we'd focus on that. We couldn't mention anything, and we couldn't even mention that we were going to be doing a lot of trades get rid of some of these malcontents so we that sort of stumbled you know what do we got to sell that we got a crummy team of people that uh, players that we, that the fans didn't like and we couldn't say we're going to trade them so we came up with a guarantee that we said we don't know when fall camp's going to be because the league was saying this could go the whole year 
and it could go till whenever. So we, our guarantee was that if you didn't like the fall, you didn't, if you didn't like the composition of the team, we didn't say Derek Coleman, but if you didn't like the composition <laughs> of the team, when fall camp comes around, you get your money back plus prime rate interest. So one of the guys told me, guy said, I can make more money by buying a bunch of your tickets than I can on the stock market. Uh, we had a tremendous increase in ticket sales. There was only one guy who exercised that guarantee. It was for two tickets, two season tickets. And I really think that he did that because he needed the money. You know, things had changed over the five month period of time. Uh, but it was a great, great uh, thing for us because when our salespeople would go on and talk to business uh, executives, the guy would say, hey, I don't like your team. I don't like Derek Coleman. I'd say, hey, that's okay. If you don't like the team's composition, come fall camp, you get your money back plus prime interest. Hmm. Wow, tremendous. Um, so, so like with COVID-19, I yeah. would consider doing something similar to that. Okay. One more question. I've kept you too long and I really appreciate it. And gosh, uh, if I would love for uh, my class to get to experience you in person sometime so they can ask their own questions. But this, my, my last question is about esports. Um, it seems to be viable as not necessarily an alternative, but as an adjunct to professional sports. Is it? I really don't know. But I also think that maybe in 20 years, the technology is going to be so great that we won't be able to differentiate between live sports and esports. My gosh, that sounds like an opportunity to me. <laughs> <laughs> John, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it and uh, stay safe. Thank you, Stan. Good seeing you.